Welcome to Liberty Law Talk. This podcast is a production of the online journal Law and Liberty and hosted by our staff. Please visit us at lawliberty.org and thank you for listening. Hello, my name is Helen Dale and I'm senior writer at Law and Liberty. With me today are Maya Forstarter and Helen Joyce. Maya is executive director and co-founder of UK lobby group Sex Matters. Helen Joyce formerly of The Economist, is author of Trans, When Ideology Meets Reality. She also works at Sex Matters, where she's Director of Advocacy. It's fair to say both Helen and Maya have quite extraordinary stories, which are best told in their own words rather than in summary form by a radio broadcaster. So to that end, let's get started. Thank you for joining me, Maya and Helen. Oh, you're welcome. Hello. Hello, hello. The common theme here is sex matters. Helen, what does sex matters do, both in the UK and elsewhere, remembering we've got a significant American audience? Well, it's a lobby group, as you say, but we would say advocacy group, and it presents the importance of the fact that sex is a meaningful biological category that is binary and immutable for law and for policy and for everyday life. In lots of things nowadays, sex doesn't matter the way that it used to, as, for example, when women weren't allowed to vote or only a man could uh, get a university degree. Um, But now sex still matters in the places where uh, it's basically comes up against reality, where law and practice come up against reality. So in things like sports, uh, in single sex facilities, in medicine, uh, in education, when we're telling children what the truth is about how they're going to grow up. And yet that's been very much blurred by trans activism over the past decade or maybe a bit longer to the extent that it's actually seriously impinging upon our ability to protect everybody's human rights by recognising sex when sex matters. Now, we're very focused on the law and we're very focused on the UK because, of course, laws differ from place to place. But sex doesn't. So anyone elsewhere who wants to look at what we've produced or what we do and think how to apply it in their own legal framework is more than welcome to do so. And we think that the underlying arguments are really applicable across the world. Yes, your website's available to everyone and there's a huge amount of resources there. It really is quite extraordinary. While I was preparing for this, I, I spent quite a bit of time on it and I thought there is a lot here. There really is. How did you personally become involved in sex matters? What made you choose it rather than continuing with The Economist? Well, I stumbled upon this extraordinary story about five years ago. Up till then, I had seen trans issues just out of the corner of my eye. And I thought that this was just a sort of a a legal fiction and accommodation for a very tiny number of people who were very psychologically unusual, who needed to be allowed to move around the world as if they were members of the opposite sex. And I think that's what most people think it is. And then just because I was asked by a commissioning editor to look at it, I realised that much more than that was happening. And in fact, we were looking at the destruction of the categories of, of sex in law and that this had really dire effects in all sorts of ways. So I wrote about it. I received the backlash that anyone who talks about this publicly does. That only made me more determined. And I ended up writing a book which came out about two years ago now. And I thought the book was going to get it out of my system and that I could just go back to, I was finance editor at the time I I was writing the book at The Economist, that I could just go back to ordinary life, um, you know, having to my own satisfaction established that sex is indeed binary and immutable and that does indeed matter. But it turned out that, you know, this is a real, actually, civilization-threatening movement, and I didn't feel I could go back to editing six pages of The Economist every week, even though it's a wonderful publication. So I took a year's leave of absence, and that turned into a permanent stepping back, even though The Economist had been very welcoming and very supportive of me and really did try quite hard to get me to come back. I would say the other reason that I decided to do it was Maya. I think she's setting up an extraordinary organisation, and I think she's an excellent leader. So, you know, I felt like I had found the right place to do what I thought I could do to help. If there's one thing I just want to draw out of that, you talked about a civilization ending movement. What makes you say that? Well, we are animals, specifically mammals, and we are constrained in our existence. We're born, we live, we die. Um, We think of ourselves as being uh, sort of ghosts and machines because we have these big brains that don't fit very well with our rather weak bodies as uh, bodies for mammals go. But the fact is that we are constrained by the fact that we are living beings. And like all mammals, we do come in two sexes. 
And so something that tries to deny something as basic as that is nearly as fundamental as denying that we breathe air or that we, um, you know, we need to sleep or we need to eat. Not quite, but pretty close to it. And you can expect dire consequences if you lie in your law and your policy making and your education of all sorts at every level in school and universities about something absolutely fundamental to the nature of humanity. At first, I thought it might be minor and side issues. People do tend to think that. They say, oh, well, you know, just close the door in the toilet. What's the problem? Or, um, you know, what's the problem? There's only one person in 10,000 or something. They don't register the fact that we're embedding a really fundamental law at the centre of every one of our institutions, every one of our laws. And the result is that we break them. When you have a lie at the heart of an institution, It flips the purpose of that institution on its head. I'll just take one example um, out of many. If you have a safeguarding institution like a school or um, the regulator for social work and you put a lie at its heart, which is that sex is a self-defined category when it is not, then that institution can no longer safeguard because safeguarding essentially requires you to say what sex everybody is. Uh, Men and women are rather different in terms of their risks and the risks they pose to others and the risks they pose to children. And so when you have a lie at the heart of an institution, the next thing that happens is everybody has to be silenced about it. And before you know it, that institution turns on its head and seeks to do the exact opposite of what it was set up to do. So now you have, for example, right now, uh, Social Work England is defending a case taken by a social worker who lost her job for saying that she didn't think that there are more than two sexes. I forget the exact details of what she said, but basically she was defending the fact that we need to be able to say what sex everybody is in order to safeguard vulnerable people and children. And she was fired and now Social Work England is actively attempting to destroy safeguarding across all of social work because it allowed a lie into its heart. And this leads me to my next question, which is why we've got both of you together. And this was done very deliberately because Liberty Law Talk is a podcast of a legally focused magazine. In UK employment and civil rights law, Maya Forstata is what lawyers often call a living precedent. Maya, how did you become one and what does it feel like? Really one step at a time. I was working for a a think tank, actually at Washington DC, headquartered uh, economic develop- international economic development think tank. I was working in London, but the main bulk of the organisation is in Washington, D.C. And the UK government was consulting at the time, this was in 2018, about uh, a proposal to reform the law that allows people to change their legally recorded sex, which is used for some purposes, such as marriage, and, and the basis on which they could do that. So the UK government was asking for people to input into this. It was a it was a topic of, of democratic, legitimate debate. I wasn't I don't work on sex and gender. I was working on international tax policy, uh, but I was in an organization full of economists, sensible, pragmatic, empirical, quite hard nosed people. And it never occurred to me that they would get offended when I said on Twitter, men are not women, basically. And in fact, they didn't. Uh, What happened was a couple of people or three people, I think, in in Washington, D.C., young female uh, fundraisers for the organization, uh, recent graduates, they complained. And I, I hadn't seen that coming. I, I had I didn't know them. I had no idea really at that time about the kind of culture that they were coming from. They complained to HR in Washington and then it escalated from there. Obviously, I didn't see all of that at the time, but when you go to court, it, it all comes out. Comes out in discovery, yes. Yes. And, you know, so, so initially my colleagues, the senior colleagues of the think tank said, well, what she's saying seems to be, you know, a bit controversial. It's it's a it's an issue where there are heated feelings on both sides, but we don't really see a problem in what she's saying. Let's ask her to put a disclaimer on her tweets, all views my own. And I did that and sort of thought that was it. But then it escalated over uh, six months and I ended up being investigated and then losing my job. And at that point, I didn't know I had any employment rights because I was uh, I wasn't employed in a sort of straightforward way. I was a visiting fellow with a 
um, with a contract. Uh, but I tweeted about it. And there were feminist lawyers who had been thinking about a case like mine before it happened. They sort of dreamt me into existence, I think, which was a belief discrimination case. So in UK law, we have the Equality Act, which brought together, it's the Equality Act 2010, and it brought together 40 years of uh, discrimination protection, race discrimination, age, disability, sex into one law. And it includes nine protected characteristics things that you shouldn't be discriminated against for. Uh, One of those is religion or belief. And it includes obviously religions, but also what they call philosophical beliefs, any kind of serious secular belief that uh, has as much importance to you as a religion. So string theory doesn't count, uh, but any belief that shapes your life Uh, somebody's won a case on on ethical veganism. And so the big question of my case was, is the belief that sex is real, immutable and important a protected belief? And my employer fought that. And so they argued the other side. They said that it's not a protected belief, that it is on par with Nazism or fascism. Those are the kinds of beliefs that don't fall under this protection And they won in the first instance. And that was what really brought my case into the public domain, because the day after they won that bit and I lost it, uh, J.K. Rowling tweeted about it and suddenly it became a a much bigger story. Uh, And I appealed and they fought that and I won. And four years later, I've won compensation for, for losing my job and I've created this precedent. So I'm glad it's over. (laughs) Yes, I've been on the, when I say the other side, I don't mean the other side as in the other party in litigation, but the other side as in the the job of both the solicitor and the barrister, because I've practised it in both arms of the the divided profession that exists in Commonwealth countries, unlike the, the US system, which is a bit different. And I have seen what is described among lawyers Uh, I have seen clients develop litigation neurosis because they are placed under so much pressure, particularly when there are multiple appeals and you have to go keep climbing up the courts. And I I think based on my understanding of employment law, although it's not my area of of experience, is that the next step, had you lost again, would have been the High Court, is that correct, or the Court of Appeal? It would have been the Court of Appeal. Uh, Court of Appeal, I think. Okay, so that's like a, for our American listeners, that's like one of your circuit courts for the Fifth Circuit or the Seventh Circuit. So very, and for an American, the next step after that is SCOTUS. So you're getting very, very serious there. So what does it feel like being a living precedent? Well, I'm glad I didn't change my name when I got married uh, because it's it's my name and there aren't many four statters in the world. Generations uh, of law students who have to write it out, remember how to yes. spell it and underline it will thank you. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, I'm, you I'm the snail in the bottle. <laughs> yeah, so so um, yes, I, I surprise people when I turn up to lawyers' parties. It's definitely the most important thing that I've done so far and it has a, an amazing kind of catalytic effect. You know, people say my name at work and it stops a grievance or an investigation or it makes their employer think twice about what would otherwise be a process that I went through, this this escalation of the idea that if you say that sex is not real, it's open season and you should lose your job. So, you know, my name has become very powerful and that's that's quite strange. But I'm hoping it's not the most important thing that I've ever done because I then went on to uh, co-found Sex Matters. If there's anything that can be said as a, as a follow-up to the idea of being a living, a living precedent, it's creating an organisation that then puts that precedent to work. It's really quite extraordinary. It's like you know, Mrs Carlyle of Carlyle and Carbolic Smokeball, which is the other classic contract case. And, <laughs> of course, the stale in the bottle is the classic tort or delict case. Um, it's like one of those individuals setting up an organisation for tort law reform or for uh, reforms to the law of contract. It, it's, it, it really is quite striking. And this is employment law and civil rights law, the way this this is working. A common theme here is working through the courts. 
engaging in multiple rounds of litigation, which you have, not only on your own account, but also in concert with other organisations like the Free Speech Union. How is that proceeding? And do you have any idea how many four starter cases there are currently on foot? I haven't got an exact number, but I think it's definitely um, in the dozens at the moment. Uh, And then there are other cases that have settled and there are uh, situations where, as I said, people have just said my name or cited the case and managed to get an employer to back down and to sort of stop the witch hunt. Uh, and, And those ones, ultimately, I think, you know, we need more of those. We need to reduce the cost of challenging this and just make it more normal that people don't get discriminated against for saying something which is completely normal you know it's what everyone thought about sex until five minutes ago and as Helen said it's something that people need to be able to understand to do their job so you know I don't want hundreds and thousands of forced out of cases because that only Mm -hmm. makes work for lawyers but certainly we need more to to sort of bash the case home so that employers really take notice and also to sort of you know, there's the first case in a university, the first case in the civil service, uh, the first case against a regulator, which was this uh, Social Work England one that Helen talked about. There needs to be a case where somebody sues their trade union who are also covered by the same regulation, the same law. The You know, the way that this ideology has gone about protecting itself and protecting the lie has been to go after people at work and shut down debate and capture institutions. So this thing of protecting people at work and protecting their freedom of belief and speech is such an important way to recapture these institutions. Um, So, I mean, off the top of my head, I think there are three cases against the Open University, one of one of our big universities, three against the Green Party. Uh, There's been one against the Arts Council, which is the big government fund funder of arts. For American listeners, that's something like the UK's equivalent of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, sorry, my, my I just thought I'd yeah, something like that, that in there. <laughs> yeah, there, I think there are several writers suing their publisher or their organisation that employs them as a writer. There's one against the Scottish government. And then there was Alison Bailey, the barrister who sued her chambers and Stonewall. So Stonewall is something like GLAAD. It's the national organisation that started off fighting for gay and lesbian rights and then over recent years has become a trans rights organisation. And Alison is a lesbian and she argued that Stonewall is destroying gay and lesbian rights, the very thing that it was set up to uh, to protect. And she sued her chambers and won, but she also sued Stonewall who were an advisor, her chambers were part of this scheme where you sign up to Stonewall and you get, they tell you what to do and you get a badge. And she sued Stonewall as being the organisation that incited her employer to discriminate against her. She lost on that in first instance, but she's appealing. Yes, uh, it so, is. So that's quite important in terms of somebody who's bringing a case against, you know, an institution that has relatively small financial footprint, but a huge influence footprint in the UK. And I'm sure Americans uh, um, would confirm that GLAAD has done something similar in the United States, because one of the things I did do before writing up the script for this podcast and going about recording it was I put out a call for questions from Liberty Law Talk's American listeners, because so many Americans listen to this podcast. And many of them express concerns at institutional capture and at the state of the US legal and judicial system. And one American commented, and this is a a quotation that I thought was a very good question, uh, gender identity ideology has crept into all our institutions and sometimes absurd judgments are made. Indoctrination in schools is taking place. Police healthcare, sport and banking, as well as the third sector, are all corrupted. And he wanted to know your views, Helen, on the extent to which the judiciary has been captured, perhaps in both the UK and the US. Quite a lot, I would say. If I start with the UK, um, the fact is our law is in a much better state than it is in the US. 
Um, we still have the concept in common law of sex being binary and immutable and the Gender Recognition Act, because it was actually a forerunner of other legislation about gender, doesn't do a wholesale change in somebody's legal status as regards their sex and has also got quite a lot of medical gatekeeping in it. So the facts of the law are pretty good and it was extraordinary really that the judge in the first instance tribunal in Maya's case could seriously think that to say what is basically the situation in British law is so wicked and bigoted that it's akin to Nazism. The exact phrase that's used in the legal test is not worthy of respect in a democratic society. Yes, I remember the Adam Smith Institute or or one of the think tanks said that you were basically being compared with people who promoted Hitler or people who promoted Stalin. Well, that's exactly right, because, you know, you can't defend all beliefs. You can't defend the belief that, you know, uh, there should be a genocide of Jews or that um, genocide of Ukrainians of slavery, or, yeah. you know. Yes. So so the, the, the test, there's a set of five tests called the Granger tests, some of which are more technical, but the one that really bites is the last one. The fifth Granger test is, is this belief worthy of respect in a democratic society? And beliefs aren't worthy of respect in a democratic society if their rights destroying. So what Judge Taylor in the first instance tribunal was saying was literally saying that to acknowledge the fact that there are two sexes and that just to, and that it's immutable. And to think that acknowledging that matters in law and everyday life is not worthy of respect in a democratic society. And as the judge said in the second case in the Employment Appeal Tribunal, it's actually the situation in British law, pretty much. So, I mean, that's not actually the test in the Granger test, is this the law? But basically the judge in the first instance had been so mistrained uh, in a, and had been so misguided by lobby groups that have influenced the the guidance that judges use in managing court cases, that he'd got himself turned upside down and thought that saying that there were two sexes and they can't change and change and that you need to be able to talk about that was literally akin to Nazism. So there's a very ongoing process of capturing the, the judiciary and a lot of it is done just by a general, you know, you're not allowed to talk about this, um, you know, intimidation of people who try to talk about it and so on. But a significant amount of it happens via this thing called the Equal Treatment Bench Book, which yes, is a Yes, I have heard about this on the, on the lawyer's Bush Telegraph, I have to say. If you could go, go on and describe that to yeah, my American so it, listeners, that would be great. It, it started as a way for judges to help other judges basically to run their courtrooms in a way that wasn't going to lead to unfairness or indeed mistrials. So things like what do you do if you've got a blind person giving evidence or a deaf person or someone who doesn't speak the native language, you know, how not to spread rape myths, how not to um, spread racial stereotypes. And of course, with all these things that start with good intentions, they become a target for lobbyists. And it has by now come to significantly embed the assumptions of what we would call gender identity ideology, that it's bigotry to use someone's sexed pronouns if they don't want you to, that non-binary identities are real, that some people are gender fluid, that uh, there can be a woman's penis and that a woman might rape somebody with her penis and so on and so forth. So Judge Taylor, I'm speculating, but I think it's informed speculation, had been through training of this sort and had come out of it totally misunderstanding both the law and reality. Now, in the US, you get very much the same sorts of things. GLAAD have a media guide, they have legal guides, they have a lot of money. Um, They're not the only ones who are doing this work. The ACLU is also, and I think the Human Rights Campaign will be the other one of the three big organisations I point at. And they are putting judges in a position where judges have totally lost sight of reality. And then the law in many American states is worse. So many American states have gender self-ID, meaning that you can just change, you can just write off and get a new birth search that changes your sex. And now your sex really is for the purposes of the law, what the piece of paper says. And lawyers and judges do tend to have this, this, this fondness for believing the piece of paper over reality. And it's funny, really, because there's a famous uh, quotation, Maya may be able to tell me who it was, who said it, a famous um, British jurist who was saying that the, he, he was basically arguing mostly for the primacy of parliament over the sovereign. But he was also saying what the limits of parliamentary or legislative power was. And the example he turned to for a thing that no legislature could do is say is make a man a woman. There's, there is a bedrock reality there. But I think after years and years and years of um, legal education and working as a lawyer and then a judge, you tend to believe the pieces of paper and not the reality. So I actually think that lawyers and judges are particularly prone to this sort of magical thinking. I'll say one more example of that, and that was a case in Scotland um, just before Christmas. 
in the Scottish government is attempting to introduce gender self-ID and the UK government is saying that that's not compatible with devolution because certain powers are reserved to the UK government in Westminster and only some are devolved to the government in Holyrood in Edinburgh. And the um, argument that the government's lawyer made for why a piece of paper can change somebody's sex is that there is no distinction between legal sex and actual sex. And the example he gave was the speed limit. He said the speed limit is whatever the government says it is. There isn't a real speed limit and a legal speed limit. There is only the legal speed limit. And the idea that sex is like a speed limit, when sex has been a fact of life on Earth for more than two billion years, and there have been mammals for more than 200 million years, and no mammal has ever changed sex in 200 million years, and we're mammals, and he's talking about speed limits. Only a lawyer can come up with nonsense like this. I think I can probably give you an idea as to why lawyers do this when they should know better, particularly as as of all the professions, lawyers are the ones who are trained to argue and to have recourse to the facts. There are only two great legal systems in the world. One was invented by the English, and that's the one that Americans and, and English people will be most familiar with. And the other was invented by the Romans, which is the one that you see on the continent, but also in Japan and Taiwan and elsewhere in the world. And all the other legal systems that exist are derived from something that either the Romans or the English developed. And if you go back to their very early law, in both civilizations, one pagan and one Christian, what you find is a form of word magic. Uh, you'll get, for example, in the common law, dueling oaths, where the person who can do the biggest and scariest oath in God's name, because they're Christian, is the one who tends to win initially. Uh, with, with, with the Romans, you get things like, uh, you also get the oath taking and you get, for example, a soldier will swear by Mars and say, you know, may Mars break my head off my shoulders the way I break the head off this arrow and he'll hold it up in front of him and then snap the head off. So there's this tradition of word magic, magical words, words that really can have an enormous effect on reality embedded deep in both these great legal systems. And I actually think based on what you're saying here, is that in some respects, this has come, it's broken through, it's come to the surface. That's very interesting. I, I, think, that, I think that's true. And I, I, when you look at how the Gender Recognition Act in the UK was developed, you know, they thought about sort of parallels with mar marriage, which, you know, marriage is partly a real thing, but it's partly a form of word magic. And they thought about parallels with adoption, and again, it, neither of them are exactly the same as somebody wanting to say that they're the opposite sex, but that's what they that's what they drew on. Yeah, so I actually think that one of the reasons why these various, and I'm going to use the word woke, even though people hate it, these various woke things have got their tentacles into so many institutions, and it's not just the issue with the, the trans debate that we're talking about here, but in certain other areas, is because they've been very good at finding a weakness that already existed in within an institution. The law's case is the tendency to rely on legal fictions. Both Romans and English do this, um, going right back to classical antiquity. Lots of legal fictions identified. The legal fiction of the corporation, the that has, is given rights to sue and be sued and perpetual succession and so on and so forth. In the Roman world, you would get things like non-citizens being treated as citizens in commercial litigation because the only commercial law that was available was Roman law. And because uh, the business of the Roman Empire tended to be business, uh, they wanted business, the wheels of commerce, to be well-oiled. And so it was just a legal fiction that treated everybody in the empire with capa with capacity, so everyone except slaves, as Roman citizens for the pur purposes of commercial law. That's an enormous legal fiction because there were huge rights differences between what a Roman citizen could do and what a non-citizen could do. But it's a classic thing that the law does. And so we finished up with that weakness being attacked other areas are where, where there's a, a weakness within an institution, various aspects of, of wokery have been able to attack it. Um, in the race debate, it's uh, been able to attack the Christian churches because of the doctrine of original sin. And it's very, very easy to weaponize that against Christians 
because that weakness was already there. You know, you are responsible for the the terrible behaviour of your ancestors, whether it's slavery or colonisation or whatever. Um, And this is repeated over and over and over again. Uh, Really quite striking. I think there's a very good analogy there with some strands of feminism. I mean, a lot of women have somehow got it in their head that if you say there are differences between men and women, you're automatically saying that there's a hierarchy and that men are at the top of it. And I mean, that's actually a very sexist idea that just because men do something and women do something else, that the man version is automatically the good one. But not ever having faced up to that internalised feeling that men are actually the pattern and women the other means that some feminists reflexively refuse to accept that there are any differences between men and women. And they may believe, you know, for example, that in a just world, men would do just as much of the childcare, you know, women would be just as likely to be chess champions, whatever. They may think that 50-50 is what you're aiming for in absolutely all spheres of life. And then those women have very great difficulty, A, in explaining why men do nearly all the violent stuff, and B, when it comes to something like sport, where you finally do see in front of you the physical differences, they have to try and say, well, you know, our minds are the same, our brains are the same, but our bodies are different. And I know, Helen, because we've had this conversation before, I mean, I've quoted you many, many times since when you said to me that um, the rad femmes think that evolution didn't work from the neck up and the trans rights activists think it didn't work from the neck down. Well, you and I both believe it worked on both bits. Yes. So that weakness in feminism of never facing up to the fact that women and men are actually different in many respects, not massively different, mostly just like, you know, sort of statistically different, except when it obviously comes to the carrying and making of babies, but different. And because feminism never faced up to that and then made the argument that that did not mean women were inferior, now it's come back to bite feminists in the ass. Yes, and it's it's good that you've turned to this now, actually, because when I put out my call for questions and issues that people were interested in, my Liberty Law Talk listeners and also on my Substack, a lot of people had something to say on the situation in which feminism finds itself. A lot of people are very angry. They think that they've been taught nonsense at university. I mean, in my case, it was obvious that it was nonsense. I was a a farmer's daughter, and so I knew what was true and what various lecturers were telling me was not true. But if you grew up in the city, if you you were a townie, is the Australian expression, uh, then you often went in completely blind. And Louise Perry has written very eloquently about going into university and being told things that weren't true and having to find them out when she worked at a right crisis centre. Ask Maya what she studied at university, you'll like it. Oh, what did you study at university, Maya? I would be very curious to know in light of this. Agriculture. (laughs) Of course. (laughs) Yeah. But one thing that came under sustained attack from a lot of really quite cranky American women, and I don't mean cranky in a bad sense, I think legitimately cranky at what they've been taught at university, was the concept of patriarchy. And uh, a few gay men as well actually joined in on this one and it had lots of critics on both sides of the pond. And there were so many questions I've had to be quite selective, so I'm just going to bring some of these up now. How can or should feminism evolve in light of exactly what you were just saying, Helen, and in in light of reality, the the reality of agriculture that Maya Mm. and I know about very intimately? Uh, Do either of you think feminism or any strand of it can accept that men and women are mentally and emotionally different from each other? Uh, Absolutely. And that strand is much stronger in the UK anyway than in the US. I, I mean, I've always called myself a feminist without saying movement feminism of any kind. But I just want to start by saying... If you think of feminism as the broadest um, idea that is trying to build a world fit for women, then you'll obviously understand that there'll be very, very, very different strands within feminism, just as there are within men's thought. Because until relatively recently, all political economy and all political philosophy was really about men, like women and children were adjuncts to them. And so men's version of how we should organise the world varies so wildly that it goes from libertarianism to communism to fascism to you know, to socialism, to uh, being a foreign policy hawk, to being a pacifist. So we shouldn't be surprised that when women sit down and say, how do you make a world fit for women? They come up with enormously different answers, some of them about as reality denying as communism is. Famously, um, uh, E.O. Wilson said of communism, nice idea, wrong species. And One I think of my favourite quotations. Yeah, he, he, was, he studied ants. 
So I think that the idea that uh, you can treat mammals as if the two sexes are going to be, you know, identical in pretty much every respect, except that one sex has a sort of an internal grow bag and pops a baby out every now and then, is about as stupid as thinking that you can impose um, an ant-based system of organising your society on a mammal. So I would say that feminism to me means creating a world that's fit for women to flourish in. And I want men to flourish too, and I want children to flourish too, but feminism specifically focuses on women and thinks, what do women need to flourish? And most women are going to be mothers, but not all. And even women who are mothers, as both Maya and I are, are other things as well. So women are much more complex to uh, fit into a world that's fit for them. But we're not even starting to think about that because we're denying what it is to be a woman. We're thinking that a woman is a man who can pop out a baby every now and then. And that's convenient if you're trying to run a business because it's hard to fit people who are mothers and the very needy nature of human babies into the modern corporation. But as long as we do that, we're not creating a world that's fit for women. Um, But we're not even talking about it properly. We're talking about a sort of a choice feminism that sees women as being men in pretty much every respect, except that every now and then they choose to drop out for a bit and pop out a baby whom they're going to give to somebody else to mind. So, yeah, I think that we need to actually, I think, and I think Louise Perry thinks the same, that this movement may actually help us to recenter on reality when we think about what it is to create a world that women can flourish in. And that's what I hope will come out of all of this when we get through all the crying after hopefully abolishing the idiotic idea that sex is a spectrum or mutable or doesn't exist or whatever the hell it is, this scavenger ideology of massive internal inconsistencies claims, that we can come back out the other side and say, all right, now, look, we do have two sexes. What does that mean for how we should organise society? As it is, it seems impossible for feminism to reckon with motherhood, fatherhood, you know, not not just motherhood, fatherhood as well. And so you get pro- this problem with reckoning with family life more generally. Yes. I mean, do you have any sense of how that changes? Well, it's because of the long run over several centuries marketization of things that weren't marketized. Like the, fam- like the market stopped at the door and inside that we understood that things were non-fungible. Like, I, off- I mean, because I worked at The Economist for a long time, although I don't have a degree in economics myself, um, I'm used to the way economists talk about things. And I've often said to my children that they are the ultimate non-fungible goods. Like you can't replace a child with a better child or an equal child. And if my sons died, I, you know, I couldn't take other ones that were in some way better, like taller or stronger or more handsome or something like that. You know, my children are non-replaceable. And it's the same once you've settled on a spouse. That's the only one person that you are with and that's the person you make memories with and that you face the challenges of life with and so on. So we understood that, but markets are like a, a universal solvent. Everything that they enter, they dissolve and they they break down into their constituent parts. And so many things have become marketized now that it's hard to fit people who are close to irreducibly non-marketized transactions or activities. And that's women much more than men because we make babies. Like getting someone else to carry your baby for you or to breastfeed your baby or to look after your baby when, you're, when the baby is small, it's not substitutable. The baby loves the mother best. The, or, you know, It can be the father. I know fathers can look after babies. But anyway, their primary caregiver, which is usually their mother, is the person they love most and other people cannot substitute for them. So unless we accept that markets have limits, but setting limits on markets is incredibly difficult. So I think it's going to be very It's so very, very tempting to to, to let them run wild. It's hard not to. They they are extraordinary things. And the reason why, and this is something that was actually noticed by the Roman jurists, and Adam Smith, of course, made a big deal of it in, uh, in moral sentiments and wealth of nations, but it's originally a Roman insight, is that if you impose, if you set up a market in something, it becomes less violent. So rather than stealing from each other, and killing people and taking what's theirs, you yes. trade instead. Yes, and, and it's not just I mean, that it's less violent, it's that it creates value. It like does. Uh, markets it, it does things create to the value. Yes. Want the most. So, I mean, the reason we're so wealthy now, it is the wealth of nations, it's because of markets. You know, I have a great respect for the power of, of markets to drag humanity out of, you know, nasty, brutish and short, both the violence point and the wealth point. But we can't even start talking about this when we aren't talking about the things that are non-marketizable, like care, like love, Mm. like motherhood and childhood, 
and we aren't willing to do that. Or if you do make them marketizable, you it, it, it becomes one of those be careful what you wish for moments. Yes. And you finish up with all the conflicts, the complexities that people are now encountering around surrogacy, for example. Exactly. They've suddenly discovered it's a lot harder than they thought. But it is so very, very tempting to do because the market reduces the kidnapping of babies and the obvious violence. So you think, oh, we've solved the problem because there's less violence, not realising you've created a whole heap of others. I mean, it's also just that, you know, you don't have to create markets. One of the extraordinary things about markets is that they, they create themselves. Like nobody set out to create a market in dating. Somebody just created a dating app and everybody came there. And now it's actually rather difficult to get together with a, another young person if you're not both on the app. And, and, you know, and, and, and the thing is that they, they ratchet, like once you have a market, you know, this is one of the magic things about markets and also one of the terrifying things about them is that it, it compounds, whatever it is, it does, it just keeps compounding and changing. And so you get to the point where you have, you know, 90% of the people I saw in an article yesterday on um, dating apps are men and 10% are women. Um, men and women have very different ways of making decisions on dating apps and much more similar in real life but, than they are on dating apps. And this just this just um, evolves. Yes. And, and, it, and you finish up with a situation where nobody gets what they want. Exactly. Everybody's and, and very hard then to yeah. reverse. I don't know how you could reverse that one. Nobody regulated dating apps. Nobody set no. out to create a world in which that's how young people overwhelmingly meet each other with the purposes of having intimate relations. Just going back to Maya's qualification in agriculture, I think this is quite a good point and it's worth writing it a little bit more. Um, you've commented publicly, I've seen you say this, I think whether it was on Twitter or in an interview, I'm not sure, that hostility to evolution is feminism's Achilles heel. And I actually think this is a wider question than, than just feminism, which we've been talking about because this has become pervasive in a lot of areas now. How do we get pseudoscience, not only out of feminism, but just debate? You know, the, the, the organised sceptical movements and rationalist movements, you could see from Richard Dawkins's travails, have just blown themselves up. I think, you know, as, as Helen said, when you when you put a lie into the heart of an, an organisation or an institution, it, it corrupts that institution around it. And, you know, the lie that men can be women is such an obvious lie. And we're seeing the fallout from that. But the the lie or the misapprehension that men and women are, you know, the same from the neck up is, you know, is only a hair's breadth removed away from that. And it's interesting, you know, often when we have conflict, you know, debate fights between, you know, the radical feminists on one side and the trans rights activists on the other side, you know, for some people, their view of the world is not that is not that far removed. And certainly, you know, we've seen how gender ideology came up through the universities from, uh, you know, women's studies became gender studies, became gender queer studies. And those institutions became corrupted, I think, around trying to protect the lie that men and women are not that different because, you know, people had fallen for the the naturalistic fallacy that if it's going to be fair, it needs to be equal under, you know, that, that men and women are, are ultimately Lego people that are sort of similar apart from the hairstyles. I don't know how we fix this other than that freedom of speech is the most, you know, it's the only way that we come to, that we come to truth, that we come to weigh different ideas against each other and protecting that protects the institution's that create wealth and that create um, stability and and all of the stuff that we've come to value in society. Uh, so so I just come back to to freedom of speech. You know, not not to any one person having the answer, but to enabling our institutions to think about what is true, what delivers value, what works, and to kind of fight fight those battles out in in words and language rather than trying to cancel people. And if I could butt in there and say it shouldn't surprise us that pseudoscience wins because we're evolved beings and that includes our mental capacity and there's a host of evidence now that our um, our brain power is largely used to rationalise decisions that we have already made for reasons other than logical ones. And in particular we're tribal. 
So when your tribe has decided to adopt an idea, it is deeply, deeply unwise not to go along with it. And the sorts of people who back in the rainforest said, hang on a sec, I don't think that's the right God. Or why do you say we can't eat that particular thing? Or, you know, what if I go down this way that you say there's a monster? Didn't tend to survive. And if they, even if they were right in their scepticism, they might be cast out and being cast out in a tribal society means death. So we evolved to be very, very, very good at coming up with ideas why what we already think for emotional reasons and for tribal reasons is right. And the scientific method and the sorts of debates that we, you know, the Socratic method and so on, are hard won, brilliant adaptations that we use in order to try to fix those um, those problems with, you know, our evolved capacity to think. And it's very easy for us to forget them or to lose them or to drop them in one domain. That's what happened with the skeptics. I mean, there are yes. plenty of people who still call themselves skeptics, but who are willing to believe that men can be women, which is about as dumb as any other belief that skeptics. It, um, I've always analogized up. To be fair, I've always analogized it with creationism or geocentrism. Well, exactly. And of course, Simon Edge's first, uh, most no, second most recent novel. It's, I think it's out, but one, the end of the world is flat. He, he, the whole conceit of that depends on analogising it with geocentrism. And I thought, how are you going to keep this up for 400 pages? And then I had to review it for The Spectator, I think. And he has absolutely no trouble keeping it up for 400 pages because that's exactly what it's like. Yeah, it's a great book. I really enjoyed it. And he's also written a more recent one, which is about Maya, basically. Like, uh, you know, it's another... It's another In the beginning. Um, ...comedy analogy. Yeah, so it's, it's, you can actually look at sceptics and you can see people who are... Say, you know, they're blasting aromatherapy and homeopathy and all the things that they can blast within their tribe without getting cast out. But they know, they know very well that if they say, oh, yeah, and the trans right stuff is even more stupid, that they will get cast out. And so their brain power manages to work without them consciously noticing it to come up with what are obviously laughably stupid and superficial reasons for why they believe what they believe, because it's it's backfilling. It's desperate backfilling. And they then have to conceal the fact that that's what it is from themselves, which is why they get so angry when you attack them about it, because it's fragile. It's, it's a sensitive place in the, the worldview that they have created and in their social acceptance in their tribe. So they, they go on the attack to try to get you to move away from the sensitive place. And I, and I think also it explains why people like my colleagues, you know, people who are not weren't bought into the ideology at all and whose sort of professional uh, instinct is to sort of think clearly from evidence and, and first principles. But I think as soon as you step into a space where you instinctively recognise that there's a danger that you will be cancelled by your tribe, it, it feels awful. Even before you understand what the risk is or anything about the content of the thing, there's a just, you know, it's like a bad smell and you back off because rationally and, you know, you're evolved not to not to fall out with your tribe. And I think that happens a lot. So people, you know, people don't even get to the point of defending the belief or considering considering the belief or the inconsistencies. They just go, here be dragons. And they go back to, you know, also they go back to their day job which is important in its own right, and they don't want to harm or destroy that or harm their family or, you know, there are all sorts of rational, understandable and very hardwired reasons why good, smart people don't want to go I here. Mean, lots of people in the women's sector, for example, people who run rape crisis centres or domestic violence shelters or so on, know very, very well that these places have to be for females only. And that if you want to serve a, a trans woman, meaning a man who identifies as a woman, you know, maybe that's fine. Maybe these people also suffer rape and domestic violence, but you're going to have to do it in some separate way. You can't have them in the group setting because so many of these women are traumatised. But funders have gone trans inclusive. And that puts a woman who's running a rape crisis centre in an incredibly difficult position because she knows the work she does is literally life saving. And she doesn't want to lose funding. She knows that there are women in grave, grave need and so she she sort of crosses her fingers behind her back and says, OK, trans women are women. I call these hostage statements and hopes that it won't come to anything. But then 
that's the fact. That's what they've said. People who can't cope with that leave. People who think, you know, have indoctrinated young women come in and they work for it. And now suddenly this organisation has become, genuinely believes that men can become women. And it must tell the women who come into the centre if they ever say anything like, you know, I'm, I'm sure she's a lovely woman, but I actually find her traumatising because I find male voices traumatising. They have to silence that woman and call her a bigot and kick her out. And before you know it, that's an organisation that is actively working against women. It's like a men's rights activism movement. It's an incel movement. There's a Brighton Rape Crisis Centre. It's the same as the uh, safeguarding principle. The, exactly. The so it turns on you on your head, actually head. upside down. It doesn't just take yeah. you off course. It turns you through 180 degrees. Brighton Rape Crisis Centre. And I have a friend who um, credits it with saving her when she ran away from home as a teenager. And, you know, they she had just experienced very serious sexual abuse in the family. And she says it was a lifesaver for her. That organisation now refuses to offer any groups or any support that isn't trans inclusive, like not even one group. Like, it could, you know, it could say that all the groups are trans inclusive except one. And a woman is taking it to court saying that that's indirect discrimination against her on grounds of sex because women really do need single sex um, support and, and, and belief. belief so, yes. So. So it's another four. It's another four starter case. Yes, there, there are four starter cases outside of employment, um, and that's one of the most. But important But the amazing ones, thing is that this Brighton Rape Crisis Centre, which was such a good organisation, like if you if you know if you talk to people in the sector, they'll say it was a leading light and that it was very early and very good. It's now an incel organisation that seeks to make it impossible for women who need single sex spaces for recovery to have them. It's saying that asking for what trauma-informed care requires is bigotry. It's extraordinary. I mean, you, you know, you, Andrew Tate couldn't make this argument and they're making it. No, he could. He, and I don't think he would, to be honest. I'm not defending Andrew Tate here. I'm not sort of holding out any brief for him or anything. But to, I, I'll be quite frank, I watched his long interview that he did with Zuby because I watched Zuby's um podcast and i couldn't even imagine him making such a bonkers argument he no, it's go worse there. than bonkers it's evil they are more evil than anything that somebody like andrew tate could say i mean it's as evil as it gets to say that a traumatized woman is simply forbidden from either saying that she needs female only space or even mentioning that the person who has just come in is male it, it is actually evil the, you, both of you have been talking about the evolutionary point and how people who ask difficult questions about why we couldn't eat that plant or go down that path or whatnot in the past uh, tended not to survive. But it became clear to me as both of you were talking was that one of the reasons why they tended not to survive was because this has produced conformity. It has produced an evolutionary tendency towards conformity. It's not just not wanting to be cast out. It's also going along to get along yes. before the questions even come up. So we've got an evil, evolved tendency to be conformist. And and it, it strongly suggests that uh, somewhere along in my family tree, I must have had a Captain Grumpy survive because I'm notoriously Captain Grumpy and don't go along with anybody. <laughs> Although I do wonder I do wonder how much of that is just caused by the fact of that you know, that I'm, I'm posh and quite well off. You know, would I be this Captain Grumpy otherwise? I suppose I was when I young when I was younger, when I wasn't, I was posh, but I certainly wasn't well off. But anyway. This is a movement of disagreeable women in the psychological sense. I don't mean that we're horrible. I mean that we are unusually willing to accept people not liking us and not going along with us for women. Jordan women Peterson's description of disagreeableness, yes. The, the yeah. proper one, not the uh, not the one that says not the casual you're, you're, one, you're, yeah. not the casual one that says that you're bad company at parties. But in the light of all of this conformity and how conf this whole movement is built on conformity, quite a lot of questions came in from both North American and British listeners about the intellectual origins of, of the trans lunacy. Because I can remember how in days gone by, and this is going back to when I first started my undergraduate degree, which was in 1990, which immediately dates me, uh, it, it only turned up in fringe humanities or social science courses. It really was on the fringe and people would laugh at it and say it was bonkers. Now it's everywhere, but it's also clear that it came from the tertiary sector. What then do we do about the universities? Gosh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, I think it, I, I, I remember reading Stephen Pinker's Blank Slate whenever it came out. I think that was in the 90s uh, or 2000s. And, um, 
being horrified but thinking oh, I'm sure he's he's uh, he seems to be exaggerating it can't be that bad as I had a degree in agriculture I didn't know anything about what, what it's like in the humanities of universities and clearly it was that bad and then it escaped the lab and it and it took over the world and I think I think part of why it takes over institutions not just universities but all sorts of established institutions is because their business model is being disintermediated and their their sources of value and the way that their career structures work and the assets that they have are all being turned over for reasons of technology and climate change and energy you know the universities may go the way of the typewriter anyway and i think that it's when organizations are in that state that they then become vulnerable to this kind of mind virus that doesn't create value uh, that destroys it but that is able to see where there is where there's a resource to be had you know and it helps people to get rid of their boss and take over you know to to gain a a position so it you know it, it turns over all these organizations that were supposed to be meritocratic and that were supposed to be running scientific method uh you know, they were supposed to be based on evidence. Mm. So, you know, it, maybe it's hastening their decline. There will be organisations that we have to save and there will be organisations that will will evolve into something else and there will be organisations that, that are surpassed. I, I'd like to point out that um, one of the major things that's happened in American universities, which is where, which is the, where this is all incubated mainly, like they are the patient zero, is the unbelievable, incredible expansion in the number of adjunct staff, like academic related, we'd call them here in the UK, administrators, in other words. And there's a remarkably good writer, an academic called Lyle Asher. I cannot recommend his work enough. And he has looked at how ed schools have basically ruined first um you know, pre-university education in America and now university education in America too. So just for your American listeners, the way that we train teachers in the UK is very different from the way that they're trained in the US. You do an ordinary degree, the same as anyone else first in whatever you like, history, mathematics, whatever. And then you do a one-year course called a postgraduate certificate in education. And that's largely done um, in school now. It used to be done more in the classroom and they were taught nonsense theories, but now you mostly spend all but the first six weeks in classrooms learning how to manage kids, learning how to get your message across. So you're an expert in your own area is the idea and you know how to teach and you're taught very um, prescriptively how to teach how to teach children to read using phonics and so on. In America, you do a degree in education is the main route and they teach you nonsense by Paolo Freire and the like, all about, you know, co-production of knowledge and the rest. And so America is still teaching children to read by methods that are well known and have been known for decades to fail because they are taught in ed schools. And then the ed schools found a new market, which was the university administrator, when universities created enormously large numbers of new roles in monitoring diversity and inclusion, in you know doing witch hunts on people who might have um, done something that could counter sexual assault and such like. And the ed schools started offering courses in university administration. And now that's like a parallel syllabus that's run with no oversight at all, no academic rigor. It's often compulsory because, you know, in the dorm you have to do the course on consent and that's where you're taught that trans women are women and that you know, just every sort of nonsense and you're taught that whiteness is cancer and everything else like that. And nobody's watching that. Nobody's checking it. It's compulsory. If you don't go along with it, you'll be kicked out. And so I really think that's been an under-acknowledged reason why American universities have gone so rotten. It's interesting that you mentioned Paolo Freire and the role of education schools, because I've got a, 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 a colleague one of the writers on my substack is a chap called Lorenzo Warby, and he's a medievalist by by training. That's his ancient you know, medieval church history, languages, history, so on and so forth, that particular area. And he had to do the one-year education course. Australia has the same rules about you have to do a proper degree, you can't do an education degree, you only do this one-year education course. And one of the set books for it was Paolo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Mm -hmm. So I borrowed it off of him 
I'm a lawyer, so I just because he just said it was nonsense. He said this is absolute cobblers, and it would not help you in the classroom at all. Yeah, just a sort of two sentence dismissal. Yeah. And I read it, and he's right. It is absolute cobblers. And then sometime later, you know, after we, it's only a little book. You take your couple of hours to read and there's no insight in it. It's just someone having a moan about the way his society is organised and maybe his society was organised unfairly but that doesn't give him the right to pronounce on education. And anyway, Lorenzo, being the kind of person who's interested in this period and, and in the early modern period, he said the situation with universities, because of the way education, particularly in the United States, the education schools have destroyed them, he says it's getting close to dissolution of the monastery's territory. That was the analogy he drew. So I lived in Brazil for several years and I was the foreign correspondent based in Sao Paulo for The Economist between 2010 and 2013. And the job I had done before that for The Economist was education correspondent. And Paulo Freire was the, the great Brazilian educationalist who completely destroyed any chance his own country had of setting up decent schools and then got exported around the world. And actually, the woman who did my office assistance out there was a trained teacher. And she was fascinated by watching my two boys who went to the English school and how they were taught to read using the standard tried and tested phonics method. And she said, I've never seen anything like this. You know, they still use the whole word method. They still say that, you know, street children in Brazil learn other ways of knowing mathematics and all this absolute bollocks. And this is part of the big part of the reason why Brazil comes out so incredibly badly on international comparisons of education is because of Paulo Freire. And he's been exported and he's still being taught to people in American ed schools and destroying the American education too. Just extraordinary, yes. I, th- that was a little diversion. Sorry about that, everybody, but a non-law diversion, but I think a, a genuinely interesting one. Uh, to get back onto the, uh, onto the legal aspects of it, and this is a question from another North American listener and heading back more towards the, the the legal arguments that we've been discussing. And she wants to know, what do you think will turn the trans juggernaut around in the US and Canada? And how best should gender critical efforts be focused in those two countries? Question for you both. Maya, maybe you try that one. I mean, the, the sort of joke of the tourist saying, in Ireland, how do you get to Dublin? And the answer is, I wouldn't start from here. Um, I, you know, I'm glad I'm not in the US or Canada. The US was patient zero and, and Canada caught it worse. But the, the two things that I think are sort of bright sparks in the US are the attention now being paid to sport and obviously how, it, I mean, sport is important to, to lots of people, but it's seems to be particularly important in the US and the whole thing about academic scholarships and and sport in school is is much more culturally important I think in the US than certainly is in the UK and and people can see that sport is just so viscerally unfair if males are allowed to compete in female sport um, and that seems to be a bright a bright spot in the US and then children. I mean, I think we're seeing almost across most of Europe now medical establishments that had gone along with transitioning children, giving them puberty blockers, the the whole idea that children can be born in the in the wrong body are turning around. And I think more slowly in the US that's happened that that you know that that is having a ripple effect and then obviously the question of uh liability for i mean ultimately i think this is a human rights abuse on the people that it's done to the doctors are making a promise to often vulnerable young people that they can uh do something to their body that will make them uh, acceptable as the opposite sex to everyone else. And if everyone else doesn't accept that, then, uh, you know, they're bigots and they should be cancelled. And obviously we're, we're pushing back on that. And if if the answer is that the rest of the population won't make good on the promise that the doctors are making, then it becomes very much more clear that that what they're doing in 
sterilizing people in cutting off um, healthy parts of their body uh, in order to try and affirm the idea that they can be the opposite sex is a human rights abuse against against those people and I think you know that will play, probably play out differently in Europe than it than it will in the US because we have different medical systems and, and different um, institutions that are liable for them. But those seem to be the kind of two areas that are really making some progress. How transferable is the UK's campaign to the US? I think it's fair to say that the campaign in the UK has been much more successful and some of that success is now spreading to the rest of the Commonwealth, but not Canada. It's spreading to Australia, for example, It's which is starting to pick up the, the UK approach to, to fighting this. I mean, we do, we do very, very legal analysis um, at Sex Matters all the time that really looks at, you know, regulations that govern schools and the procedures for dealing with children who have special needs and the details of how the Equality Act works and so on. And Obviously, that level of granular detail is not transferable. And in fact, some of the international law stuff isn't transferable to the US either because the US isn't a signatory to all the international conventions. So, But, but it should be transferable across Europe, quite a lot of it. I mean, Maya's case does go back to freedom of belief in the rights that were written into um, UK law in the Human Rights Act, but they come from the European Convention on Human Rights. So she is citable as persuasive across the across Europe. Um, in, the, in the US, I think um, it's much harder to make these uh, arguments like freedom of belief and freedom of expression, but you can look at your constitution in the US and say, well, what what's there? And I mean, you've got better freedom of speech rights in America. Um, so I would say that people can look at the materials that we produced and the stuff that's about bodies and sport and, you know, not indoctrinating children and so on, that should be very transferable. But you may need to think smart about how to convert an argument that's about freedom of expression in the European Court of Human Rights into freedom of speech in the Europe, in the US uh, constitution. You know, the, I mean, the other difference between the US um, and the UK is there are just much lower employment protections altogether. Part of the reason why I think my case happened was because the HR decisions were being made in the US by people who whose experience is that you can tell anyone to clear their desk. Contracted um, will, it's, it's called, yes. Yeah. I had to explain this to Americans that Australia and Britain don't have that and that if you have freedom right. of speech or freedom of expression, uh, then you, you have it in both the public and the private sector. It, it doesn't matter. It's a, There might be less of it, but what you have is held equally regardless of whether you're a state employee or a private sector employee, whereas in the US this whole co- culture of contract at will in the private sector just means, as you were saying, people can just be told to clear their desk and walk. I think another difference that's very important is that America is so politically polarised that it's very hard to do things through the legislative route, at least at the federal level. Um, You know, we've seen a significant amount of engagement from politicians here, either the government in power, which is the conservative led government, realising very belatedly that it was asleep at the wheel while all this nonsense came in since 2010, which is how long it's been in power. But also on the Labour side, realising that even if this doesn't turn into an electoral issue, which I don't think it will when there's a cost of living crisis and so on, there's a very serious risk that it turns into a real albatross while Labour are in power, which is what they're expected to be from the end of next year. You know, nobody wants to have press conferences in which every single one, no matter what it's about, somebody says, Prime Minister, can I ask you, what's a woman? Prime Minister, what share of women have penises? Prime Minister, you know, is this rapist uh, a woman, he says he is, but is he? That sort of thing. You you want that done and dusted. But in America, the political system is more captured. So Democrats are willing to say these unbelievably ridiculous things more willingly than any party is here, except possibly the Lib Dems, who are nuts. But also it's very hard to engage with legislators in a constructive way that might allow you to do a proper process of fixing broken laws. And that's a big part of why so much gets resolved in the courts in America rather than in the legislature. You end up with abortion rights being a Supreme Court matter and then being overturned, you know, whereas here we just passed a law. Like there was, the argument was between the legislators and then there was a free vote and then the law passed. And it's been amended since uh, to bring down the age at which abortion is generally available. So I think maybe that work will have to be done at the state level in America, where you engage, do the hard democratic work of engaging with lawmakers and explaining to them 
that more than one person has rights here. There's been a general pattern globally of seeing only the trans-identified person and thinking that what you do for them affects nobody else and forgetting that when you allow a man into what's meant to be a female-only space, you destroy the female-only space for all females. And when you tell children that one child in the class is a special type of child, yes, he looks like a boy, but actually he's really a girl, you're lying to and indoctrinating all children. And there are rights on the other side, in other words, the right of somebody to say who they are, like this right that we absolutely have invented out of nowhere and centred in modern discourse. Uh, You know, my identity is mine to define who I am. Nobody else can tell me. That is being allowed to overrule everybody else's rights. And, you know, different countries have different systems for balancing rights and different lists of what the rights are. But the advice I would generally give to people is look at the rights on the other side. When you allow a man to lie and say he's a woman legally, What rights does that destroy? And where are those rights in your law? Because they'll probably be there somewhere. Like even in Canada, you know, sex is there in the charter. Mm. Much of British public dialogue, too, is also quite secular. This is another thing that occurred to me when I was putting this together. Uh, How do you think Americans should attempt to deal with this issue in a society that has much more religious public discourse. It's very clear that a lot of the most effective opposition to to gender ideology, as as you would call it, in in the United States is coming from people who are varying degrees of religious. Yeah, I mean, you you know, the US has separation of church and state in a way that we don't have, and yet they have a much more religious society I do think that, uh, you know, often it is people with a religious conviction who are willing to stand up against this because the, you know, that whole calculation or maybe it's not a calculation, but that whole feeling of one, who your tribe is and two, what it is you've got on the line. Is it just your current good life or is it your future soul? You know, those things make people act in, in very different ways. Um, so so I think certainly from a legal point of view, when we're looking at these cases about belief discrimination or about freedom of speech, the freedom of speech of people who are religious helps to protect the freedom of speech of people who are not and, and vice versa. And so we do end up, you know, with kind of strange bedfellows and I think, I mean, in the UK, we we get this accusation thrown at us all the time that, you know, Sex Matters is a non-partisan organisation, religious people, non-religious people, right and left. But both Helen and I are atheists. And, you know, we're told you're, you're in bed with the, with the religious right. Um, but it's a sort of it's not a very hard accusation in the UK because there isn't really a religious right. We don't have right. one, no. There's, there's, the church, there's the Church of England, which is, you know, the, the sort of religious establishment, but that's something that's something quite different. Whereas in the US, the political partisanship, the, you know, the split between the right and the left and the split between the religious and the secular is, is much more divided. Um, and so I sort of... I don't have an answer, but I do think that thing of uh, religious people's rights and non-religious people's rights are the same rights. You know, my my right that protected me at work was religion and belief. It protects people who believe and who don't believe. I think that's that is ultimately very important. I've received emails from people in the US telling me both that I should stop talking about religion at all and think about how. I um, come across to, uh, in in the particular email I'm thinking of, I mean, she's a lesbian woman who went to Berkeley and is absolutely secular and a lifelong Democrat who's absolutely distraught at what's happened to her party on this issue. And she said, you know, she said, like, think, think what it sounds like to somebody like me, that you're willing to talk about evangelical Christians' rights so that you're willing to talk to and quote the ADF in your book. But then I also get people saying to me, that I should be working better with, um, you know, people like Matt Walsh or something like that. And I think in the end, all I can do is say what I see as being the way forward as somebody who is an atheist, who thinks that there is probably a biological basis, not only for sex differences, definitely a biological difference for sex differences, but probably also for sexual orientation, and who recognises that this ideology is sterilising gay kids disproportionately. 
And I just, I just have to say how it looks to me and be completely transparent about um, my worldview and my intellectual convictions, which center around the primacy of evolution and let those words fall where they may. And because Maya and I are, you know, as these things go, pretty much free speech absolutists, you know, we stop at the don't shout fire in a crowded theater, don't put copyright material online, you know, don't actually libel people. Um, but, be, but short of that, we want all voices to speak. And so I, I, I can't pretend to be who I'm not, and I'm not willing to put other people outside what I think is a very broad tent. So I'm willing to talk to all sorts of people, and I'm willing to be platformed with all sorts of people, short of actual Nazis. Um, and the accusation of who's a Nazi, I have become very sceptical about, because I'm routinely called a Nazi. Which oh, is so a very am strange I. Welcome experience. to welcome to the club. You know, all, yeah, all the good of... people are now, and some bad yes. people, but all the good people are called Nazis now. That's a very dangerous route to go down. Well, you know, yes, somebody it, it, like it, me, uh, an anti-Semite, a Nazi, a homophobe, a transphobe, uh, a shill for the far, for far right American money. There are people who are all of those things, and are not a single one of them. And it dilutes the force of them to call somebody like me those things. Well, what it does is when you get a real one, yeah, it it's... becomes an instance of the very, very famous folk story. And the reason fairy yeah. stories exist is is to tell us fundamental truths about the way the world works. And the fairy story I'm thinking of, of course, is the little boy who cried wolf. Yeah, if you cry wolf too often, eventually the real wolf will come. The the real wolf comes. No one believes you, and someone in the village is eaten or worse. I do think that people are going to start laughing more at the idiocy of this. In any time I ever show somebody a picture of one of these trans athletes on the podium, like some enormous middle-aged, rather chubby bloke who's just beaten some incredibly athletic women who, simply because he's male, people do laugh. It's the first mm. thing they do. They are then absolutely mm. you know, destroyed about it, but they think it's funny and it is funny. And so there's a podcast. There's a podcaster who's American, actually, and he got in lots of trouble uh, because it went up on YouTube. But he did one. His name is Josh Slocum, and he did one of his videos, and it was over the weightlifter La- Laurel Hubbard, was it? That's right. And and anyway, Josh is gay, very flamboyantly gay. So you need to sort of imagine that. And he put pictures of Laurel Hubbard up behind his head in in his in his little chat show that he does, and just went. I'm sorry, you can see his meat and vegetables. Yeah. And the way it was presented, it was impossible not to fall about the place laughing. And, and so, I just thought, that's an icebreaker because it's absolutely true. Yes, and it, but it's more than an icebreaker. You know, once you start to laugh at the, uh, the wizard behind the curtain, all bets are off about what happens next. The thing that worries me most, and it worries me more in America than anywhere else, is that if the longer this goes on, the worse the backlash. And the backlash is going to sweep up not just perfectly ordinary trans-identified people who just want to be left alone and who don't intrude on other people's rights, but it'll also uh, sweep up all feminists, whether you know, whatever they believe, whether they're sex realist or not, and all gay people too, because the LGBT yes. lobby and the forced teaming of that so, yeah, I mean, this backlash is going to be horrific. And I regard myself as somebody who is attempting to limit the damage by stopping the ideology from going to the far reaches of complete absurdity of enormous numbers of children sterilised and so on in order to limit the backlash. This is uh, leads me to my next question, which came in also from an American listener. And she speaks, I'm going to quote her, but she probably speaks for about 30 people who wanted a version of this question. And I'll quote her. She said that she feels politically homeless. And she, a direct quotation, she said, I'm a long-standing left winger, but wokeism drives me nuts. How do you both think debates like these will shape politics and the direct future direction of conservatives and progressives? I think we're all politically homeless. Everybody who has any sense now. I mean, where are you meant to, which package are you meant to pick up? I mean... I, I really, really dislike the Republicans. I dislike them for having come up with a candidate like Trump. I dislike their, you know, lack of acceptance of women's rights of various sorts. I dislike lots of things about them. I dislike their acceptance of the way that money acts in politics and the big business acts in politics. But I mean, how can I support the Democrats if I were an American? You know, they're literally the party that is forcing a child sterilization agenda into schools. So hopefully we break a lot of things and something better comes out. 
And I try not to grieve too much about the amount of destruction in this creative destruction process, but it is actually horrifying. Like all these institutions that so much blood and toil and sweat and tears was put into making and that have been hollowed out and destroyed from inside and I don't see any way to prop them up. I just tried to look forward and not back because honestly I'd sit down by the side of the road and cry for the rest of my life if I thought about what we have lost. One of the questions I was asked was, uh, and this was on my Substack actually, rather than through Liberty Fund, from an American also was, my God, what happened to the American Civil Liberties Union? <laughs> and that is that question that just came to me when you were saying that. It, it, all of these organisations, it, it's heartbreaking. And, you know, as as, Hel- as Helen said, they, they turn around to be exactly the opposite of, of what they set out to be you know the the ACLU defended the freedom of speech of Nazis they went they went that far in order to to defend the freedom of speech of everyone else and now they're telling us we can't misgender in the the feminist organizations are uh, fighting against against women's rights the greens have forgotten what nature is and biology (laughs) you know every and I think you know, the, the organisation that you love the most is the one that breaks your heart, mm. but it, but it's everywhere. I mean, I'd add to that Stonewall, um, which is our gay rights, was meant to be our gay rights organisation here. And yes, it's the equivalent of GLAAD and uh, similar organisations elsewhere, but it was very specifically set up to counter a particularly homophobic piece of law known as Section 28, which made it impossible for schools to present gay relationships in anything except, uh, you know, they're fake, they're pretend, they're they're not real relationships and therefore made it impossible to tackle any sort of homophobic bullying in schools because a teacher who simply said, you know, look, what's wrong with being gay? Or yes, okay, they're two gay people. They love each other the same way that a man and a woman might love each other um, is promoting an ideology that was, and they were specifically banned from doing so. So Stonewall was set up to counter a law that permitted homophobic bullying and made in particular teenagers, gay teenagers' lives miserable. And now Stonewall is the biggest voice campaigning for an approach in gender clinics for children that sterilises gay kids. So it is now the biggest voice in the UK that's pushing for gay kids' health to be ruined, their sexuality to be destroyed, for them to be turned into a simulacrum of the opposite sex and slotted back into society as fake straight people. And it is the most incredible incredible reversal of all of them you know now somebody who has two sons one of whom's straight and one of whom's gay I feel absolutely sick that this organization you know Maya and I know some of the founders who are equally sick about it it's the worst and most heartbreaking of all the betrayals for me personally for a lo- I got the impression for a lot of Americans uh, maybe it might reflect the fact that many of our listeners on Liberty Law Talk are in fact legal practitioners the one that breaks their heart is the American Civil Liberties Union. Yeah. So that might just reflect that that might just reflect a lot of lawyers listening to this podcast and and reading Law and Liberty, but a lot of them are very very upset about the ACLU and that that they haven't got used to the idea of having to transfer their loyalties to Fire, which is the new organisation, which it isn't new, but it used to only do uh, free speech issues on university campuses. Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression. It used to be Foundation for Individual Rights in Education and they had to change their name. And a lot of Americans have not got used to the fact that that it's not the ACLU anymore. They have to go to the fire to to do that job. It's very, very hard to give up on something that you really loved and that was a lodestar for you for a long time. Oh, people who donated lots of money to it over many years. I had, without naming this individual, I had someone message me in advance of this podcast who said that over the course, you know, success, successful legal practitioner, you know, lawyers as a general rule are not poor, particularly commercial lawyers. And this gentleman told me that he probably donated a hundred thousand US dollars over the years to the ACLU. Yeah, um, amnesty really breaks my heart as well. You know, an organisation that was set up to stand up for some of the world's most silenced people, namely political prisoners, who often can't even get a letter out. You know. And now Amnesty Ireland is run by a really committed trans rights activist. And he says that uh, women who believe the sorts of things that I believe, which is mostly not a belief, it's mostly just fact, but then on top of it, accepting that those facts matter, we should be denied political representation. 
we should be hounded out of public life. We should not be listened to. And, um, you know, I, I used to go and knock on doors for amnesty. We all want operations and surgery on children to stop, as you've alluded to, as well as the prescription of puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones to minors. And it does seem, based on what you've been saying and what I've been told, that these are common and ongoing in the United States. However, how common are they in the UK now? How common is treatment with puberty blockers and hormones in the UK? What is available on the NHS? What is available in the private sector? How does provision differ between the USA and the UK? I think you probably know more about that than I do, Maya. We're not a medical organisation. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're sort of following what's happening in the UK, which is uh, that the Tavistock Clinic, which was so the Tavistock Clinic is the was the National Centre for Child Assessment and Counselling. So they don't do operations, they don't do uh, prescription, but what they were was the national gateway so that any child who in, in England um, and Wales, I think, who, who uh, presented their GP with gender issues was referred to the Tavistock Clinic and then they were assessed and if the Tavistock Clinic assessed them as as having gender dysphoria, then they would be referred on for hormones and surgery. Uh, And the big thing that has happened in the UK is that that uh, centre is being closed down or that contract is being taken away from, it's it's a larger hospital because of the spotlight that's been shone on the impact of puberty blockers, hormones and this pathway to surgery. The UK government commissioned uh, a eminent paediatrician called Dr. Dr. Hilary Cass to look at the evidence base for how you treat or how we are treating unhappy children who place the source of their unhappiness in their sex, in their gender identity. Uh, and she came back with there is very little evidence that any of this helps and the evidence base the the arguments for it have shifted over time the the arguments for what, giving children puberty blockers were initially that they would improve their mental health mitigate the you know the the feelings and the the depression and risk of suicide and so on but actually the reason for taking puberty blockers is to stop the physical appearance of of being the sex that you are in order to more successfully appear to be the opposite sex. And there, there are terrible things that go along with that. And all, so all of that has kind of come to the fore and the clinic is being closed down. But, we're, but what is going to replace it is going to be a set of regional clinics around the country which are supposed to be more evidence-based, but are going to be harder to have any oversight. And, you know, the one, I think one reason why things have happened in the UK in the way they haven't in the US is that we have the NHS, we have a single commissioning organisation, and we had a single assessment clinic. And so there was a lot of attention and scrutiny eventually placed onto that onto that organization and now that's being dispersed around the country there's a danger that it it may get worse there's a danger Um, it may start to look like federalism because one of the reasons why and I, i know this from having lots of australian friends and having grown up there one of the reasons why even though the debate in australia looked quite similar to the debate happening in the uk one of the reasons why australia is so far behind the uk in terms of fighting off the translunacy, basically, is because it's a federal system. And as soon as you have a federal system, as soon as you have dispersion of authority, which of course is what federalism is meant to produce, that's why people came up with federal systems and uh, it, t- t- to break up authority so you don't finish up with this centralising unitary power that crushes everything in its path. But one of the reasons why there's difficulties in Australia has precisely been because of its federalism. You finish up with a multi-headed monster and you have to individually go around and behead each one. And so, yes. I think that's true of of this whole thing. I mean, I think, you know, the thing about sex is it's 
older than human beings. It's older than mammals. It's one of, you know, it's the most fundamental thing. And so it is relevant for every area of law and policy and power and resource allocation and and all of these things that are broken up into different levels and layers of government and different sites of decision making. And the way that the gender ideology has kind of captured institutions has been, you know, both through kind of federalism, geographic federalism, but also through the sort of, you know, vertical dispersion of powers and decision making in all kinds of large organisations, because that's what you do in large organisations, so that no one is ever responsible for the decision. And so in in the case of medicalising children, no one is responsible for deciding that a child should have surgery. The, the Tavistock Clinic assessed the child and decided they have gender dysphoria, they can be referred to an endocrinologist. And then the endocrinologist, you know, their job is to check the child's bloods and to make sure that the, they're giving them the right amount of the hormones in terms of, you know, bringing them up to a certain level, but they don't know anything about the child's background, their their psychological state, what you know, why they're there. And then by the time they get to the surgeon, all of those decisions have already been made. The child is on this pathway. The child has this expectation. And the, the surgeon's job is is purely technical. Can they turn this piece of flesh into a piece of flesh that looks something different? And and that decision starts, that decision pathway starts well before they, they're any, anywhere near a clinic, which is in a school where the school is saying, well, maybe we should just allow this child to change their pronouns. And that's, we're not, thinking about surgery but that's what that's what they're putting the child on the pathway to this is what's happened the whole way along with this field if you go back a century to the first doctors who did anything like this which was around 1930 in germany and what they did was they created anomalous human beings who were really very hard to fit into a very much more gendered society you know this is back at a time that you know women had less voting rights less property rights that sort of thing and then law had to in some way respond. It didn't actually in Germany because, you know, something else happened in Germany about several years later and distracted everyone. But it popped up again in the US. And because the US is a more distributed system in the 1960s and 70s, the individuals who ran um, registers of births and deaths and also um, registers of marriage in town halls around the US, because the US didn't have a, a, a national uh, organized system for for recording these things individuals had to make decisions when i was doing the research for my book i found a particular registrar who um said that of a particular man who had had genital surgery and came in wearing a wedding dress with a man he wanted to marry uh, said well if they come in here wearing a dress i count them as a woman but another uh, registrar wouldn't do that and then in the uk what happened is there was a very precedent setting legal case which said that no uh, a man can't count as a woman, even post-surgery, for the purposes of marriage. But there were these anomalous human beings who were being made in a clinic already on the NHS and also abroad, mostly in um, in Casablanca, and then coming back, having had surgery, and very, very hard to know what to do with them in a system where your pension rights, who you could marry, your ability to travel, what it said on your driver's licence, all these things, they marked your sex. And so bureaucrats made decisions on an ad hoc basis in order to allow people basically to work and to travel. And that's how come we got sex change markers, uh, sex markers changed on passports and driver's licences. And I'm uh, actually aware of a couple of people in that circumstance, uh, both one socially and a couple of others through legal practice. Yeah. And so those people then created a legal accommodation for people that doctors had jumped the gun with. Like doctors not only didn't, not only did any one doctor not really make the decision to chop this person up um, and to put them out into the world and tell them that they would be accepted by everybody else as members of the opposite sex, but they didn't check whether other people would accept them as members of the opposite sex. And they're still not checking, but the law had to respond to these facts on the ground in ways to accommodate them. And so over, over many decades, there was this movement that ended up in some American states and at some national level governments as well, where you can change your birth cert because it's deemed that it, not to allow people to do that would be very, very hard for somebody who's gone through all of this surgery. And then the last bit of that chain 
is people bringing human rights cases. They've done this in the European Court of Human Rights and in some other international and national courts where they say that making anything dependent on being sterilised is a human rights abuse, which I agree with, by the way. Yes, I have to say I don't actually agree with that, but then I don't, don't agree with a lot of human, human rights. rights. Fine. No, but, 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 but anyway, when you agree with, or disagree with, with it, that, I'd argue yeah. from the other end, I'd say don't go chopping people's genitals off and because it, in, it is in itself a human rights abuse and we don't have to call it a human rights abuse. You can just call it an atrocity if you like. But anyway, so the argument went, you're willing to give this man a piece of paper that he very badly wants and which brings some rights with it, for example, to have a heterosexual marriage with another man. And you will only do that if he chops his penis off and makes himself sterile. So you must do it without him having to chop his penis off. And that won. And so that's why um, gender recognition laws around the world in most countries now don't require any surgery. And it was meant originally to be a, a, be a, a sort of a compassionate concession to this tiny number of people. And now it's just a right in many countries. I have to say, when reading trans, Helen, I found your account of the emergence of hormonal and gender surgery during the Weimar Republic extraordinary. And for listeners who haven't read trans, which I recommend you do, you can get it from bookshops, even in the United States, it's not been banned yet. Here's a potted summary with a little bit of extra detail that I've added because I've done some research in, in this area as well. The Institute of Sexual Science was founded in Berlin in 1930, and among its sex toys for kinksters and treatments for venereal disease or infertility were hormones and genital surgery for people who wanted to change sex. Although clearly strange and run by people who were even stranger, it appears to have been internally unpolitical. Founder Magnus Hirschfeld was a gay Jew and a drag queen, for example. Meanwhile, its in-house surgeon and inventor of the virginoplasty, Erwin Gorbrandt, not only joined the Nazi party, but went on to conduct lethal medical experiments on inmates at Dachau. Crucially, the Institute's beliefs about human sexuality rejected Darwin's entire theory of evolution, both natural and sexual selection. Its staff behaved as if Darwin had never existed, and that's a quote from Helen's book. Hirschfeld thought all human beings were bisexual, meaning not the sexual orientation, but that they were both sexes and thus indistinct or on a spectrum. Males and females, he wrote, were, and this is a direct quotation, abstractions, invented extremes. Because my first novel, The Hand That Signed the Paper, had an Eastern Front setting, when I was researching it, I also became aware, and this was in the 1990s, that what is now called autogynophilia has a troubled history, and not just in Weimar. One of the reasons Field Marshal Zhukov, the greatest of Soviet military commanders in World War II, attacked through the Romanian formations at the Battle of Stalingrad, and I quote from Zhukov here, was because we had captured some of their officers who were wearing women's makeup. This was one of those little historical details that finished up on the novelist's cutting room floor. But when I read your book, Helen, and as it has become clear how many leaders in the trans right movement, the wider movement, are autogynophiles. I'm not sure if that's correctly pronounced, but that's how I'm going to say it. Uh, that little bit of research came back to me. How do we respond to the reality of what is clearly a serious and destructive psychiatric condition and how much more research into it is needed? Yeah, I mean, for, for your readers, you are pronouncing it perfectly, or for your listeners, um, autogynophilia means love of oneself as a woman. And it's it's a contested diagnosis um, or category, but it's obviously correct if you ever read any um, sissy porn, as I forced myself to do when I was writing my book, and I don't recommend it. And basically, it's like um, cross-dressing, erotic cross-dressing on steroids. So rather than a man thinking, you know, he, he puts on women's clothes or women's underwear in order to masturbate, um, which probably about 3% of men do, uh, he becomes really, con really convinced that there is a woman persona inside him or that he has a woman persona in some sense. And probably men have, some men have felt like that all along. But when being a woman meant you couldn't vote and you were mocked and you weren't allowed to go out in women's clothes or whatever, men didn't act on this. Whereas now if you do it, you're stunning and brave and you are the most oppressed and you are somebody who can 
do astonishing things like get invited to the White House uh, to celebrate um, a day of lesbian power. Like there are two men at the table with the with President Biden at the most recent example of that, both of them men who think they're women and think they're lesbians. So now it's really being encouraged. I think if we weren't encouraging it, it would probably just go back into private bedrooms mostly. And I mean, I'm very sorry for women who marry a man who doesn't tell them that this is his sexual fetish. Um, and I'm not trying to belittle what they're doing, but I also don't think it's the business of the law to regulate what happens in people's bedrooms, short of actual, you know, murder and such like. So we focus on the law and public policy. I think the issue is that a man saying he's a woman is then accepted as his right, his ticket to go into places that these men find sexually arousing. And if we took away the ticket, I wouldn't care so much if he thought it would be arousing to play in women's sports or go into women's changing rooms or whatever it is. Um, because autogynophiles find it all arousing. They find all um, all taking on the social role of a woman arousing. I mean, they're extraordinary examples. You know, they find pretending to menstruate arousing. They find um, imagining uh, taking the pill arousing or knitting or pushing a baby carriage or all these sorts of things. It's, it's absolutely the fantasy is to inhabit the role of a woman. And if we can take away the bits of that that impinge upon other people outside the home, well, then they can do it if they like, and I don't care, and, you know, on they go with it. And sexo- it can go back to just being an issue that sexologists research because they do research these things, and that's fine. It's a useful thing to know, and they can counsel these men, and they can tell them you aren't actually a woman, and you can't pretend, and you can't go into women's changing rooms because that's perverted, and you're harming the women. Um, if you want to fantasise about doing that, you know, be my guest. I asked that previous question, including the the, the long exercise and throat clearing first, because of what has happened to comedian and sitcom writer Graham Linehan. It's fair to say his situation exploded into a national scandal across the UK last week. And from what I've seen, a significant part of the extraordinary venom that is directed at him is because he was one of the people and is one of the people who constantly makes the autogynophile connection. Yeah. I mean, what, what do you think? Yeah. Here? I mean, it, it is, it, there's a fantastic expression that the author Alice Drager came up for it, which is, it's the love that would really rather you did not speak its name. Because the fantasy is to really be a woman. You don't disrupt other erotic fixations or even sexual orientations by saying to the person, oh, that's what you are. Like if you say to a gay man, you're a gay man, you're not causing him any difficulties here. But if you say to a man whose ardent desire is to really be a woman, not to pretend to be a woman, yeah, but you're just a bloke, aren't you? You're just a bloke in a wig. He will respond with narcissistic rage. And that is what we see. It is absolutely what we see. But it's very difficult. That is why Linehan has been absolutely hammered. Yeah. Hammered. I mean, I would say that he has been treated, of anyone involved in this debate, I think he's up there in the top two or three for the sheer level of venom and nastiness directed at him. Yeah. And it, 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 the other thing that happens with poor old Graham is that it's 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 laughably easy to um, misrepresent what people are saying. Like, we talk, we think about this all the time. Like, how can we, like, that, that's one of the reasons I say I'm stepping back and I'm saying what the law should be. And I mean, I don't think Graham cares what people do in their bedrooms either. But when you talk about that, people say, oh, you're saying all trans women are perverts. You're saying that there's paedophiles in this movement and they're all paedophiles. But the thing is, there are paedophiles in this movement because it's an anti-safeguarding movement. And paedophiles yes. arrive everywhere that you are not careful about safeguarding. But he is misrepresented as saying that he thinks they're all perverts, that he thinks it's just about perversion, that they're all paedophiles and all bad people. And then he gets angry, which is very understandable the way he's being treated. Uh, it's really hard. You've got to be a saint to do this work. You've got to be able to have people shout the most horrific misrepresentations at you and somehow keep your temper and keep saying, I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about the law. And I mean, he did make the point. And he told me personally, but he also made a point in an article for the for the for the Daily Telegraph, which is a British centre right newspaper, that the comedy routine that he did um, up in Edinburgh, when they finally managed to hold the show to the ticket holders and it finished up being held in in public at the Edinburgh Fringe outside the Scottish Parliament, was the first bit of paid comedy he'd done for five years. That's how thoroughly he'd been cancelled over this before it blew up into a national scandal last week. I mean, I think the comedians, the, the, the things that are funny are the things that we're not allowed to say. And so you have to cancel the comedians because 
as, as if you can laugh at things and if you can say you know if you can point at what the reality is then you know then the emperor has no clothes and so he he has been quite viciously cancelled and and you know and one of the things that he's very angry about understandably has been the cowardice of other comedians yes and other comedians who we know don't believe in this who we know were laughing about it five or ten years ago and now are not laughing and not saying anything and if you yeah if you can close down the comedians then that's freedom of speech gone my last question is back to the law again One of the reasons charities like the UK's Stonewall went so badly off the rails around trans issues is a legal one, and that's because charitable trusts can exist in perpetuity. They don't have to vest. It's a basic principle of trust law that all of us lawyers are taught when we're baby lawyers and then some of us get to use it as practitioners, as I have. And that creates a problem when the charity's work is done, as Stonewall's was after the enactment of same-sex marriage into law. And it's very clear that one of the reasons why they reoriented themselves towards trans was in an attempt to stay relevant and keep the donations flowing. With that in mind, do you think Sex Matters will ever be able to wind itself up? Will you get the opportunity to be the anti-Stonewall? I really hope we will. I mean, I think the problem that we're trying to solve is huge and demanding on one hand, but is also just very, very stupid because sex is real. Everyone knows sex is real. Everyone has a mother. Everyone will continue to have a mother for for the foreseeable. You know, people will continue being male and female. And I think once we break the spell and break it in enough places, then reality will fight back. And so I hope, you know, we're not intending to go on for forever. And, you know, I've certainly looked at Stonewall, both in terms of how did they do that? Let's do what they did, but also let's not make the same mistakes they did. I often analogize it with um, bindweed or Japanese knotweed, depending on which analogy, like how how, how pessimistic I'm feeling on that day, because bindweed is hard, but Japanese knotweed is really hard. So this has spread while nobody was doing the weeding, but you could conceivably pull it all back out. And that's what we're trying to do. And once we turn the tide and you know each landmark legal case or... Um, each person who's uncancellable, as J.K. Rowling turned out to be, that's a good strike in the right direction. But we have to keep pulling out the bindweed. Um, the day that we finish pulling out the bindweed, I hope we pack up and go. I didn't intend yes. to be doing this work, and I don't think Maya did either. No, no, she didn't, in fact. I thought I was going to write a book to get this out of my system because it was driving me completely bonkers. You know, it was going around my head, all the stupidity, all the idiotic arguments, all the dumbness at the centre of it. I wanted to write it down to get it out of my head and then go back to editing six pages of the world's best news magazine in the, um, every week. But I mean, it turned out the madness you know, has gone further than I had any idea of. Um, and I will keep pulling it out until it's gone. And then I'm stopping. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, thank you very much, ladies, for your time. You've been listening to Liberty Law Talk which is owned by the magazine Law and Liberty, a publication of Liberty Fund. Thank you for having us on, Helen. Thank you for listening to another episode of Liberty Law Talk. Be sure to follow us on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts.